I'd like to ask you, what, I mean, do you agree? Do you disagree? Am I right? Am I wrong? Have you got examples of sabotage that you've seen firsthand that you'd like to share? So, that's it. Yes? When you were talking about the uh, cable plug-in, I have to figure out what kind of, that was exactly our IP. <laughs> I, I recognize our IP. So did, did, did you and back here, I mean she has a very soft voice, so she was saying that the, the example of the, the, oh we have to plug in this cable and whether or not we're going to have a 64-bit system, the IT department, yeah, instead exactly. of supporting your work, yeah. Exactly, and we already asked them to talk to, to think, like, mm -hmm. not to just, if, even if they are writing an email, it's like this. Right. And the, the main, infor the, the import important information is like that, you know. I, I, I should add that to my but, list. Write long emails. <laughs> <laughs> what, why do you think they're doing that? I have no idea. They well, do guess. from the first time I got to the company, like every time. Were they given a bad example? I don't think so. Is it, is it part I, of I the culture? Just, I think they just want to... It's about two guys and I think one is worse than the other one. Mm -hmm. And I think he he wants to seem to be really smart. Or... That's <laughs> that's not only your opinion. There's a guy called Alan Cooper. He wrote a book called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum, and he's the inventor of Visual Basic. Alan Cooper, so a big time geek, lots of respect. Um, and he describes what's called intellectual bullying, and he says that uh, for a physical bully, you know. A big kid. My, my son is like this. He's two and a half years old. He's bigger than most of the other kids. He pushes them down. Well, eventually what's going to happen is another kid's going to push him down, and my son will learn, hey, don't do that. With intellectual bullies, they don't even recognize when they're being pushed down. And so they, they grow accustomed all the way through high school and then college and then at the workplace. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so smart that they think they're the uniquely smartest individual in the entire world and they want to show it off and they want to exercise that power and, and, and make sure that you feel stupid because that, that way I feel smart That's and exactly what they do because every time I need something they, they communicate with me as I am the stupidest <coughs> person <laughs> Exactly When in fact there's a million things you know that they will never know so this is a problem. Uh, do we give power to people like this in the organization? Apparently, they, they probably have the power to stop everyone's work. Right? IT always has power. Yes. Yeah, to delay things. And then they think that they're doing a good job, and they get promoted. No, they don't. In our case, they don't. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's also another problem, is they feel like they are smarter, and then they are jealous of watching other people getting promoted when they remain in the same position of plugging cables in. Which frankly, if they're plugging cables in, they're not that smart. Because that's a pretty low IT position. <laughs> Thank you, that's, that's a good example of exactly how somebody who's trusted in the organization and has that position of power can sabotage the efforts of others. And maybe, let me give you a tip how to work with them. Oh, you're so smart. <laughs> stroke the ego. Yeah, stroke their ego. A ask them about, hey, do you, do you read science fiction? Get them talking about something they're interested in to get them onto your side. Give them a little bit of that recognition that they crave. Maybe they'll be nicer. Chocolate also works. <laughs> <laughs> Kofala and donuts. Kofala and donuts, yes, yes. Weird little, weird little geeky things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I'll just add to this. I, I think one of the most important things to do, certainly... Turn do around these... so that they can hear you behind, so I'll, I'll hear you fine. Yeah. All right. I'm kind of loud anyways. I, the, I think you have to be careful on some of those things because this is absolutely true. Is you certainly have to recognize 
what, what their, their position is, but I think more authentically is to engage them in the problem in the beginning. Not yeah. simply like the cable thing, but more generally, what is it that you're trying to do and then have them become part of the team, part of the solution. And I think that then that kind of releases this, this power position where they clearly can see themselves as being part of the solution rather than just being somebody who gets called in at the end. Mm. I think we all feel like that generally. If we're only called at the end, you know, when the fire alarm gets pulled, then there's always this sense of, you know, your lack of planning is my emergency. And mm. people become very frustrated with this. I think the same thing is true of police officers, right? Police officers, day after day after day, who do they have to deal with? The problem makers, the trouble, the, the violent people, the offenders. And they start getting the attitude that the world is populated by offenders. And, and the IT people, because they're only brought in when you have a problem, they start thinking that the world is populated with people who make problems. And so, yeah, bringing them in at the beginning. Bring them in sometimes when things, when something works well. And tell them about it. Hey, you know what? I, no, I'm not calling you because I've got a problem. I just wanted to let you know, this new monitor is great. Thank you. Because otherwise they will become too one-sided in their perspective. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Exactly. I would throw in, actually, I love our IT department. <laughs> They're excellent. I don't want to be anti-IT. No. But when someone comes to you with a problem, it seems like you have multiple ways of solving the problem. If you ask me for help, my problem is to deal with you. So I can do one of two things. I can either put forth the effort to solve the problem, or I can convince you that it's too complex. Mm. Your computer is slow. Oh, I just need to put in a RAM stick or something like that. Well, I could tell you, oh, I got to get the express. Blah, 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 blah. There's, it's too complex. Mm. And if you agree with me, my problem is solved. Right. Even though yours isn't. Mm -hmm. That works for students too. Good point. <laughs> yes. Do you guys have some more examples of? Have you? Has anybody here sabotaged a project? Come on, be be truthful. Not yet, but it seems to be a great uh, <laughs> trend, I would say, it's cool. because it's much easier than to do a really great job. I and think. sometimes it's rewarded. You create a problem you and then, it. hey, you've got a job forever. Exactly. But perhaps it could be a great idea to set up a company for doing this for other companies, competitors. Well, example. then you can make something like Open Card or the. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No comment. No Sorry, I'm not not living uh, in Czech Republic, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually, it sounds it sounds to me that it, mm -hmm. it could be something uh, you can hire someone to do a damage. For so you have a consultancy editor. where you place people with the enemy company. Yeah. In a key position and then they will sabotage it, yeah. and they're actually getting paid by you, as well as their salary yes, from the other company. The other company. Which That's an evil that. idea. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. I'll, I'll, I'm going to forward that to the embassy. I think they might like that. <laughs> there was an example in the back there. Yeah, we had it one time where we were doing the same job on two different sites, and the materials on one site had run out, but we kept the ones that we needed, we kept on our site, even though we weren't ready to use them. So we didn't want them to get ahead of us, and then we'd have to get them back or reorder. So we just we slowed them down so that we could get ours done. Yeah. Well, messing up someone else just to make yourself look good, or yeah. Yeah, it was just also just to keep us busy. It's just that we had stuff to do, otherwise we would have been sat around. So they were ready before us, but we we, we made them wait longer. True. True. Uh, when I was in the military, I was in a fighter squadron. Uh, on the USS Kitty Hawk, and we would do the same thing. We would have the extra parts, and we knew that the other squadron needed our parts, and we wouldn't give them to them, because then they would look bad, and then we would get some extra privileges for looking good, and yeah, sabotaging the other people by hoarding our materials instead of working together. And, and our enemy wasn't the Soviet Union. No, our enemy was VF-24. That other squadron. Yeah. 
So, some more examples. Sir, has anybody personally sabotaged a project? We learned that uh, at some management level, people don't understand what the people be below them are doing. Right. And they do decisions that they should not do. And it creates an environment where people below, uh, in a, of a, such a manager, can behave in, in, in a way they describe, and then they will not recognize that. And they will, they will do exactly promotions of incompetence and they will punish performance because they just see that they are troublemakers mm. and they don't understand anything. Exactly. Well, this, this is a, that, that company I was telling about that I was with where I was making the training videos and then they kept on wanting to insert marketing stuff into the training video instead of just telling people how to do their jobs. It was all about Oh, and you're going to love this. And I said, well, no, they're not. They, they just need to know how to do it. <laughs> and as a result, yeah, I kept on slowing down, and I found reasons that there were problems, and yeah, I, I helped sabotage it because they offended me. Pre previously, as I understood, uh, when people get into some uh, management level, they have to go through some positions below. So they do understand the process, what's going on there, what the people below them are doing, like either that it's the case in Michelin, mm. and uh, these days those managers are sometimes picked up externally, even uh, not, not, not knowing the domain they, the company works in, right. and the, the, the worst case, I think. Right. I, I was reading an article recently about a university that hired a, a CEO, a former CEO from a, from a company and they made them the university president because they said, oh, well, if you're a good CEO, then you would be a good university president. And the faculty is basically revolting. So you have no idea what it's like being a teacher. You have no idea what we're doing. And you're treating us with disrespect to even, to even put someone like that in. So, but of course, we can have the opposite problem where if you only hire from within, then people are blinded to what's happening outside and what innovations are possible outside their own realm. So it's a, tip, it's a tricky problem. It's a tricky problem. Again, self-sabotage, unintentional. Yes, sir? I was working for Embassy, and I, I work in energy field, and I came up with an idea. I was like, hey, we can save quarter million crowns saving this energy. And, uh, there was a leader of the embassy leaving the job and I thought, well, there won't be any trouble for him because he's already leaving, no risks for him and it was completely easy to do and what he came up was like, well, uh, we have to look what's the, what's the law about this uh, complex law within the European Union like, and other embassies and, and it was really like a sabotaging, like a lot of fields, what you said not to do it because it would like risk his position it could fail and it could be on his name so it took like a year like th this this could take a four uh, two weeks to do this and it took a year within the embassy to come uh, to do it and just because once somebody was clever it's like yeah go forward with it mm -hmm. but it could be sabotaged forever yeah, institutionally institutionally people protecting their positions yeah can sabotage. I have a question. How can it happen that uh, incompetent people get promoted, promoted and competent do not? Uh, how can it happen? What's the reason? How can it happen? Let me open that up. I think there's some people with a lot of experience here. I'm not the only... You've got an answer for that, don't you? How is it that incompetent people get promoted and competent it's people get promoted? are weak. They want to make sure that weak people are around them so that they're not threatened. And so they get all the monkeys around them and then they're safe. It's a way of creating safety. If, you won't, if you're the smartest person in the room, make sure there's nobody else who is smart. And then you will always be the smartest person in the room. Uh, Microsoft has an example of that, where they, they promote the top 10% and they fire the bottom 10%. So the best way to get promoted, make sure that you're on a team with stupid people. Don't ever get good people on your team. If, if someone good comes on your team, sabotage them. Right? So it could be the system itself is set up to reward incompetence and punish performance because it's seen as a threat. Um, 
you know, think of a, a lead singer in a band. And they have some backup singers in back. Do they want the backup singers to be better than the lead singer? No, the lead singer will fire them. Because, oh, you're making me look bad. In, in the theater, it's called upstaging. Right? If, if you're ever an extra in a film, which happens all the time here in Prague, you can be an extra in a film like that. They want to make sure that you don't have any acting talent. If you have any acting talent, they don't want you as an extra. Because you might threaten the famous actor that they're paying a lot of money to. They want to make sure that you're just going to sit there and do what you're told. And if you're really good, no, you're gone. It would, seem, it would seem you would want the best actors possible on the film. That's not the case. They don't. They want a few good ones, and everyone else shut up. Uh, more examples? Of All right, but uh, you are safe, but the company is not you. They are not developing themselves. They are just stuck. And your position might be safe, but... But the company as a the whole... Market, you are getting down. The Windows Phone. <laughs> Ten years ago, there was a Windows Phone. I had one. Did everything the iPhone does. It was killed. Yeah, so they protected themselves because it, the, the, the people who were in charge of the PCs didn't like that. And so they protected their positions. Did it help the company? No. It, it meant that Apple could come right in and steal all their customers from them. So this is why it's a, it's a form of sabotage. But unfortunately, this happens all the time. It's not rare, it's common. And, and you're, you're young, so you're going to see it throughout your career, and it's going to piss you off. Uh, and I'm sorry. Get out of that company. Leave that company. Because they're sabotaging themselves, and if you stay in the company, you're going to start sabotaging the company. You can't help yourself. You're going to be offended. You're going to feel like you're not appreciated, and you're going to end up doing slower work. You're going to end up making problems. It's, it's human nature. For example, I, I, I joined one uh, <coughs> investment bank and my manager, uh, we were, I was doing some, some reporting stuff and I came with an idea of making something more generic and reusable mm -hmm. in multiple places. And my manager came to me with like 20 suggestions, what it should do. So I, I said to myself, well, good, fair guy. So I made it in like two or three weeks, then came back to him, that it was silence. And it took me like a half a year to find out that those 20 suggestions were given to me just to avoid me doing the job. Right. Uh, it was like troubles for half a year because I didn't know, had no idea about his intention. Right. Yeah, it's insidious. You had another example? No, I just had a thought. Uh, one of the things that, by the way, I thought this was very good. Uh, well, thank you. So I, I've been in business for about 25 years and uh, ran my own business in the United States and started doing a software startup here. And, uh, and this is absolutely dead on, uh, this last 45 minutes. I would invite you if, I don't know who pays you or brings you in, but if you could do a, a follow-on discussion and then focus on the solutions yeah. as to how you know folks who might not have the experiences should address these things like inviting the IT guys in for Coppola and donuts and ending the problem and, and then and, and how, do, how do you as soon as you identify and assess you know if an organization has this dysfunctional behavior whether you should you know push the button and blow it up and run away or or is there an opportunity to lead and start from within you know more positive, constructive uh, programs because f for every one of these there's, there's there's a counter movement that you can make mm -hmm. and, and then you just simply have to assess whether you can or cannot you know make differences but but I, I think I, and I know you know all these things already and I would it would be great to hear another 45 minute the other side of the story so we don't leave going oh my gosh you know, what a <laughs> miserable world this is like, well, well let's I mean uh, what is our time now how much more time have we got? So we still have 30 minutes, and actually my intention here with the discussion is exactly, you know, have some fun telling examples, but also let, let's bring that up since, since you, you brought it up yourself. What are some ways we can prevent this? I mean, 
sorry, the, the Reebok shirt there. What's, what's your name? Mark. Mark, how would you prevent some of this? Like, uh, I, from my experience, I sometimes do the least important work first because it's easy and it doesn't take much energy for me. Uh -huh. But I know that uh, when I do things like very hard and difficult at the beginning, when I have a lot of energy, I do them more efficiently and more, more faster. But they sometimes aren't the more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So I postpone them and start with the easiest one. Well, some, one, one simple thing, organizationally. Give people an uninter uninterruptible block of time to work on difficult things. One of the reasons I'll work on the simple tasks is because I know I'm going to get interrupted every 20 minutes. At least I can get something accomplished by going through my emails instead of doing the work I'm actually supposed to do. So simply having you know, a rule in the office that no emails, no phone calls, no meetings from 8 o'clock in the morning until 12. And that's the time when you're supposed to work on the difficult things and we'll let you do it. But we're also going to monitor and make sure that you actually did something. Right? That could help because a lot of times I'll do the trivial stuff because I don't want to invest the time and effort to get into the difficult problem knowing that, oh, another interruption. Uh, uh, well, how would you prevent some of these things? Well, it matters where you stand in the company, what are your competences, but the best is to just work on yourself first. So, you, because I do some things, and I did them, and I didn't know it's kind of sabotaging, but then I met people that let me, and I, I, had, I call them bullshit detectors, or people that tell me, mm -hmm. well, don't spend this hour on logo, just code the stupid header, and the logo can be done by somebody else. So, mm. people that are my friends, good enough to tell me, no, don't do this, it's not that you do it wrongly, just do this, because, it, so they have more experience, or they, they are giving me, like, constructive feedback, so, I don't, I can try to not to judge what they say, like they, they are angry at me. Mm. I'm just thinking, why do they say it? So more listening to what they say. Than so, so being open to bad news, yeah. instead of punishing bad news, reward it. I mean, do, does, has anybody ever gotten a reward for pointing out a problem at work? <laughs> why not? Wouldn't that be... That would have prevented this entire NSA links thing if Edward Snowden had an opportunity to be rewarded for his concerns instead of being punished for it. <coughs> for example, or in Microsoft, if, if the people with the Windows phone had been rewarded for all of their work instead of punished because, oh, that doesn't fit into Steve Ballmer's vision. Humility, you know, a little bit of humility in what we do and honesty and openness. Your friends are the ones who tell you when you're messing up, yeah. right? Someone who loves you will tell you that you have a, a problem drinking. You know, the, the, the guys down at the pub, they aren't going to tell you. They're just going to encourage you to keep on drinking, for example. What, what are some other solutions to, I mean, obviously, create simpler processes. Again, we can, go, we can look at the agile movement in software development where you have iterative spirals instead of having all of the waterfall requirements written up in front because that's too complex of a, comp of a process. Have, have shorter release cycles. In the software world, this seems to be having a positive effect. And if we look at, well, the example of the uh, Obamacare website again, classic waterfall disaster, right? 55 contractors. What do they expect? Uh, some more solutions? Yes? Um, may I have another question? How can Absolutely. You, uh, how can you uh, find out that you are the one who is sabotaging something? And, yeah. And how to discover it and what to do with it? Like, what should be the first step if you, if you already find out that you are the one? But, like, I mean, it's an uh, intentional problem. Oh. How can you discover? Good question. Anybody? Maybe look at your work and you look at the other 
Yeah, so, so she's saying, okay, it's unintentional. And, and you know, you, you go to a lecture at, at Chevut with the Innova Centrum, and you're sitting in the lecture and you go, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> mm, I keep on making these long speeches, right? I, 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 I'm the one who's calling all the meetings. Ugh. Mm, I love to tell irrelevant topics. Now what do I do? I mean, again, it's, it's honesty and humility, right? Um, are you able to, to honestly say, hey, I'm the cause of these problems? Uh, do you go to people who say, hey, you know what? I recognize that I've been making a lot of irrelevant speeches at our meetings. And you, and you ask your friend, if I'm doing that, can you do this to me, please? Tell me to stop, please. Uh, trust your friends. Don't keep it a secret. So tell the friends that you can trust, people who are on your side, you just say, hey, I've recognized this bad thing about myself. Can you help me stop? Just like when you're quitting smoking, right? One of the most effective things is to get somebody else who's quitting smoking, your accountability partner, to you know, stop each other. When you get that urge to you know, argue over wording or always advising caution, you know, maybe your best friend should have some secret signal. <laughs> do, do you guys have other suggestions? I, I don't know the answer. That's a great question. But what yes. if you are most, like, uh, in the case, advice, cautions? So sometimes your boss or somebody else wants you to ask permission for everything. And even if you know that it's like blocking you, Print out a copy of the CIA manual. <laughs> and send it to highlight <laughs> that <laughs> highlight that passage. <laughs> Say, hey, I found this fascinating thing and I just wanted to show it to you. And then make sure you have that next job lined up first though. <laughs> this is yeah. a backup strategy. Redundancy. Yeah, if, if you're in a toxic environment, get out. Get out. You're too talented to waste your time. That's, that's one thing. But if, if you can change it, again, be open and honest. A lot of this is the result of hubris, of arrogance. Right? You know, the companies that make, them open to, make themselves open to sabotage. We don't sabotage good organizations. We tend to sabotage bad organizations. Right? I mean, when's the last time you heard about a church being sabotaged? It's, it's more often going to be some corporation that people feel is evil. One of the reasons why Google has been so successful is that don't be evil motto that they have. And the reason why Microsoft is the constant target for hackers is because they've done things that really make people angry. So if, if you're in a toxic environment, you know, you could be learning these bad habits and get yourself out of there. Or, but if it's, if it's just a, you know, an isolated incident, or if it's just your small group, go to them with openness and honesty and say, look, I see this happening. And we really ought to stop it because we know what the result will be. Um, but if you're in an organization that will just punish you for it, then get out. If, if that's, that's probably too simplistic an answer, and I'm not sure it's the correct one. It's just what I think of when I'm standing up here. So ask me again in a week. Yes, sir. I have another question. When you said that you should share in your ideas and information with other parts of your team, mm -hmm. I think that sometimes it can happen that someone takes the advantage of you and get ahead of you, mm -hmm. and then he gets a promotion and the money. So where is the line where you should share and when you can decide to keep the information for you. Well, I wish I knew an answer to that. Do you I, have I, one? Actually, we're, one of the projects we're working on right now is doing kind of Facebook for scientists. And uh, this is a big problem with scientists. And one of the solutions we've come up with, we, not in production yet, but is actually to publish quickly and broadly so that everybody sees it's your idea. And then if somebody tries to steal it, 
it's time stamped and everybody really knows where it came from. So I would be more public and, and broadcast my ideas and not be have the single point of failure that I'm going to depend on my manager to promote my idea as my idea. Yeah, talk to more than one person. Tell the idea to as many people as you can so that when John tries to take credit for your idea, Ralph is going to say, Dude, that wasn't his idea. <laughs> Right. That, that's one possible way. But also you know, recognizing that human beings are human beings and sometimes they're nasty and want to get credit for things they didn't do, right? And we have to live with other human beings. Get away from those kind of people if you can. Start your own company. But I'm, actually, this, this might be something that's, that's a little bit over, overlooked in the study of management is how much this is a motivation for entrepreneurs. How many times successful people, the reason they went out and started their own company was because they were angry. My ideas are always being stolen. I never get any credit. I keep on seeing the incompetent people getting promoted. That's why I started my own company. So it, you might turn it into a force for good as a motivation to not be in that environment, to create a better environment. I felt a bit depressed that a lot of things you said are actually a description of the political system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there are like meetings, speeches, committees, uh, <laughs> meetings, uh, they argue about uh, nothing, and they always say that the law and everything, and yeah, so it's kind of a description of the political situation. And then the, the question is, how do people react? Yeah. When they're yeah, in this they situation, they commit, they commit sabotage. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in the form of protest. Mm -hmm. I mean, David Czerny's new yeah. <laughs> sculpture, <laughs> the purple hand with the finger up. Um, not really sabotage, more in the form of protest. But if protest doesn't work, what comes next? So this is why listening to protest is important. Right? Instead of, instead of beating the protesters, actually listen to them. Imagine how history would be different. You know, for example, Mubarak, instead of calling out the army to try to suppress the protesters, if he had actually tried to implement some reforms, he'd probably be still in power today. Perhaps. Mm. Or moreover, you bring solutions all the time, and you always hear the same people just telling you why it don't or it will don't work. Right. But they have no idea what is their opposite. How, how so, so they are not trying to solve the problem. They are trying to stop the any protest. changes or uh, stop doing anything on on that uh, state of the process. I have, I have an anecdote for, for that. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, many, many, many years ago, I had the opportunity to interview the, the science fiction writer Ray Bradbury, the famous writer Ray Bradbury. And uh, we were talking generally, and, and I asked him if he had any advice. And he said, well, this is the only advice I'll give you. Um, if you have a new idea for innovation, for, for how to make a, a solution, how to change things, go to the experts and tell them your idea. And they'll probably tell you that you're wrong. Listen to them, because they have experience. That's why they're experts. But if you think that you're still correct, even after listening to the experts, well, go ahead and do it anyways. And again, most likely you're going to fail. But if you succeed, go back to those experts and give them a chance to apologize. <laughs> and if they won't, rub it in. <laughs> So, so one of the things we have to do at a certain point is, like you said, we can have protest and protest and protest and solutions and solutions and they get blocked by the same people. Go around. Go around them. You know, form a new political party. The pirate party is an example of this, where, you know, there's an obvious problem. Kids should not go to jail for downloading music. Come on, that's wrong. It's just wrong. It's obviously wrong. But when we go to the people in power and we tell them, hey, that's wrong to put a kid in, mute, in jail for, for downloading a song, 
And, oh, well, and they do all of this, right? Well, sometimes the solution, create a new political party. If that doesn't work, then you create something like Anonymous, which, you know, whether you love them or hate them or disagree with them or agree with them, they've been very powerful. And finally, sometimes you have to take, you have to risk everything and, and do like Edward Snowden, who, you know, he, he tried to go through channels, he tried to tell people, hey, this is, this is what's going on, he wasn't allowed to, and so he, he lost his, his girlfriend, his house, his everything, his freedom, to, to tell the world what now everyone recognized, yeah, that's a serious problem, right? And, and still today, I, I think a lot of people regard him as a traitor who should be killed for what he's done. Other people regard him as a hero. So, at a certain point, sabotage is a moral question. More than anything else, it's a moral question. Right? And sabotage can be used for moral or immoral purposes. Are you sabotaging something good, or are you sabotaging something evil? Right, so we've got this poster from World War II. Right, it's obvious that the partisan there is considered a moral actor, destroying property for the greater good to stop the Nazis. Right? So, sabotage is not only something to be prevented, it can sometimes be one of the few solutions available. And from a, from a business perspective, right, if people are sabotaging your work, ask yourself why. Because sometimes it's not about preventing them from sab sabotaging you, it's about removing the reason for the sabotage, right? So, are, are, are there, I think, a couple of final questions and then we'll wrap it up. Yes, sir, and back. Uh, what do you think, how the future will be, let's say, in 20 years? I think it's going to be easier and easier to do whatever sabotage, and the system will be more and more complex. Uh, so, our companies or government or Anything. Mm. It's going to be kind of like there's going to be more threats than there is now. And and how will the governments and organizations react? Authoritarianism. So I'm I'm actually kind of pessimistic. I think there will be more sabotage and more repression in reaction, and the more repression, more sabotage, and we get into a vicious circle where. The reactions to the sabotage is worse than the sabotage itself. Going around and around, more totalitarianism. As uh, Morozov says, and, and I highly recommend listening to him, uh, technology is not the friend of the saboteur. Because it also gives the tools of the government to track you down and capture you. Or entrap you. Um, while simultaneously, it's a vulnerability that the governments are, are slowly beginning to realize they have, and their sort of natural response is to become more repressive and more violent. And so we're going to see long jail sentences for hackers. We're going to see people getting put in prison more and more for acts of protest that will be described as sabotage. Um, but these governments, these same governments, the more totalitarian you are, the more fragile you are. So uh, I, I, I cannot predict the future any more than anyone else, but from my own perspective, it, it, it looks a bit scary. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, that um, the Czech Republic is more free today than the United States. There are more personal freedoms here. Uh, there's greater respect for privacy and individual differences here in the Czech Republic. I would say that uh, this, for all of its faults, and I complain constantly <laughs> about 
about this place. Uh, the Czechs are one of the freest, you have one of the freest countries in the world today. And I hope you don't lose it. I really hope you don't lose it. Well, we've seen the case where Goldman Sachs, uh, they, they had a Russian programmer who was working on the high-speed trading systems and copied some open source code to do optimization. And then he got another job at another company. And all he did was copy again that same open source code that he had taken and then implemented there in, in Goldman Sachs. Uh, so that he could use it as a reference, just as a reference. And Goldman Sachs had the power to get him prosecuted and thrown in jail for four years. When no computer expert would ever suspect that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, there was another case in San Diego recently, which is my hometown, where a guy was protesting the banks and he used children's chalk to draw on the sidewalks. And they tried to put him in jail for 16 years for, for writing some signs on the sidewalk. You know, stuff that you can wash off in five minutes with water. They got the, uh, the city attorney to charge him as a criminal for that. Uh, so he ended up in a jail for 16 years? This is one of the rare cases where the jury basically nullified it. And even though they, he was prohibited from bringing the First Amendment even as a defense. And the jury was smart enough to see through it and, and threw the case out. The judge was unhappy. The judge wanted him to go to jail. The jury forced him to be free. One of the rare cases of justice. Uh, but I would see more and more of this. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to sound like a revolutionary firebrand or anything like that, but the government is not in control of our laws, especially in the United States. The, the big corporations are writing the laws, paying for the lobbyists who are writing the laws. The congressmen are working for those corporations. They're not working for the people who, who are elected. And this comes from personal involvement in politics since I was 16 years old. And in 2008, I took the entire year off of work to do nothing but work on political campaigns. And there's no way to stop this. And so here I am, 2013, and uh, I'm, I, I thought I would be the last person to say this. I said, don't waste your time voting. It's a joke. You're only given the choices that they decide to give you. So I see the corporations and especially the, the concentration of wealth, that the 1%, so to speak, having more and more power and acting in a more and more totalitarian way. And one of the few solutions to that is sabotage sabotaging them. Mm -hmm. And they are going to react with more totalitarianism, and it could get really ugly, my friend. But they're not prepared, right? I mean, that uh, it's still going to be easier and easier. To, to make, well, we heard today that you hire somebody to go to the competition and you know, steal the, the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, there's the paradox of it. The more sabotage, the more totalitarianism, the more totalitarianism, the more sabotage. In the end, sabotage, this is an open question, is sabotage a winning strategy? You can obviously inflict a lot of damage on someone, but can you actually win through sabotage? I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think our time is up. And I've been firebranded up, so thank you all for showing up today. Thank you, Innovation.